Ladies and gentlemen, Cody Azari. So when I was a young boy, I, I wanted to be a fighter pilot. Nothing more than a fighter, fighter pilot. And I'm not sure what attracted me to it because I would never be able to kill someone. I would never be able to drop the bomb. But I think there was this sense of power within these machines, this sense of purpose, this sense of commitment, and the sense of the mission that there is no failure. You have to make this mission happen. Uh, and it has to be perfect because you have a 20-something million dollar plane in your hand. Um, except there was a problem. And the problem was that I'm Persian. Uh, I'm an immigrant from Iran. And any self-respecting Iranian parent would never let their child be anything better, more than a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer. Those were the three options, but mainly doctor or an engineer. And there was, there was no choice other than that. So there was no way my parents were going to let me do anything otherwise. Well, this story kept ringing in my ear from my parents. Doctor, engineer, doctor, engineer. This was this incessant little tweaking that I heard always. Um, so I had to tell a lie. And, and my lie was, you know what, I'm going to become a, law, uh, a, a physician. And, and I said that just to get them off my back. Um, and really, that's all it took. And then all my family members started to cost me. And in one particular case, I remember this little old lady that was a family friend that lives in Pittsburgh. She would start sending me articles. And she sent me articles about this young pioneering transplant surgeon by the name of Tom Starzl. And this was a man uh, that was revolutionizing the field of transplantation by performing liver transplants. Now, liver transplants are commonplace right now, but back then they weren't. Liver transplants were unbelievable at that time. And to put it into perspective, these were bloody, bloody operations. Some of these operations would require a thousand units of blood, a thousand units of blood for one person. In fact, they were so bloody that in a large room, these were not small operating rooms, they would have to put blankets at the doors so that the blood wouldn't gush out into the middle of the hallway. On top of that, for example, in the city of Pittsburgh, they would have to stop elective operations. They would stop them because the city's run out of blood for this one per patient. So none of the other hospitals could do elective operations because there's no blood available in the city. Add to that, the patients were dying. They either died on the table or they died in the ensuing weeks. Now, can you imagine what this young surgeon was going through? Uh, the hospital administration was after him, the public was after him, the media was after him, uh, and why are you doing these operations? Yet he had this conviction and he had this sense of purpose to know to push the operation forward. And now today, transplantation of uh, livers is routine. In, in our hospital, for example, we do three in a given day. Yet it took this person's convic conviction to do that. So. I decided, you know what, I think I can. I'm, I'm gonna be a transplant surgeon. So I decided to go to medical school. Yet, in medical school, a transformation happened to me. And the transformation was almost in gross anatomy class. And it was the dissection of the human hand. And the reason this transformation happened is, I'm not a religious person, but if there's any evidence of divine intervention, it has to be the human hand. There is no greater source of functional anatomy other than the human hand. It's, it's perfect. It's an, it's an organ of grasp, so I can grab things. It's an organ of strength. I can break bricks with my hand. It's an organ of precision. I can play the concert piano or the concert violin with, with the same hand. It's an organ of sight. I, I want you to close your eyes, touch anything in front of you without looking at it. You know exactly what you've touched. It's a sexual organ. And finally, and it's an organ of expression, you all know what this means, you all know what this means, you all know what this means, and you certainly know the New York taxi cab driver is a middle finger. <laughs> so, could we do hand transplantation? Could we actually take a hand 
from another human being and attach it to a hand of somebody that's lost one? Well, nobody had done it back then. It was only in thought, yet the complexities were too great. So I decided to become a hand surgeon and go into hand transplantation surgery. And I thought it would be done. If it was going to be anywhere, it would be in Pittsburgh, where this young man was. So I went and did a general surgery residency. I did a plastic surgery residency. I did a hand and microsurgery uh, residency. And then I did a tissue engineering fellowship. Wait, th did I just do what my parents had wanted me to do? <laughs> a doctor and an engineer? I, I think so. So the, this, was a, this was a grueling period. And it was a grueling period of 110 to 120 work hour weeks. Uh, and, and I remember not having an entire day off in one year. In fact, I, I remember walking into this, the MRI unit with my wallet. I forgot to take it out to, to, to push a patient in in the middle of the night. And then my wallet became demagnetized. So my credit cards became demagnetized, and I had run out of cash. I couldn't use an ATM, and I wasn't able to go home at all. And I wasn't able to go to the bank and get my ATM reset, my credit card reset. So I remember begging for money uh, from, from my co-residents for about a 10-day period. Listen, can I have your meal card? I'm, I'm really hungry. <laughs> Anyways, 18 years after high school, I'm, I'm finished with training. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and, and now I'm a hand surgeon. So obviously, I take my first job in Pittsburgh where we're trying to dis start a hand transplantation program. And this was a, a program that took almost seven years to put together. It took an extraordinary amount of effort to put this amazing uh, program. And towards the end, we were ready to do a transplantation, except the next problem happened, and it happened to be my wife. My wife gave me the ultimatum. There's no way that she was going to take another winter in Pittsburgh. So my only choice was move to California. So right before we were able to finish this program and perform transplants in Pittsburgh, I moved to California. Yet there was no way I was going to be denied. I was going to absolutely participate in this program, and I was absolutely going to do this operation that I had devoted at least 18 years to, to learn how to do. But not many people had done it before. So I'm in California, and it's March of 2009. And we received a call. Our first patient that we were on the, on the transplantation list had received a match. He had a, we had a match. We had a donor for him. And he, he was a young man. He was a 26-year-old Marine that had lost his dominant hand in a munitions accident. Um, I, I don't know what it means not to have a hand. Um, I don't think many people do. I know what it means when I get a paper cut. I can't type that day. I'm, my finger is sticking out. But I don't know what it really means not to have a hand. Yet, we have a hand for this man. Um, and and the, why it's such an incredible experience is it's difficult to find a hand. Not only do we have to have the exact same match, so it has to be a blood group match just like any other organ, but it's, this is an external organ. It has to be matched according to size. It has to be the same size. It has to be the same color, the same skin tones. It has to be the same hair patterns as, as this marine, and we found that. Yet, I'm in California, and the hand's in Pittsburgh. I got the call during the middle of the day. It was a, it was a Thursday, and I was already in the operating room, and I certainly couldn't stop my operations. I finished my operations that day and took my car, went to the airport, and bought the first ticket out of Los Angeles. Now, uh, visions of 9-11 are happening to me because you know there's this crazy guy saying, I got to get to Pittsburgh. I got to get to Pittsburgh with a credit card. I don't care if it's one way or not. You know, um, <laughs> Took the red eye, and I was in Pittsburgh. Now, it's 24 hours that I've been awake. Um, and, and in the plane, I was this caged animal. Uh, I was I, I couldn't sleep. My 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 legs are shaking because and and I can I can sense that when I look at boxers, they're just standing there when they're giving the instructions by the referee. They're they're like these animals that want to explode. Yet something they're just waiting to go. And I was just waiting to go. Yet at the same time, I was filled with this incredible sense of dread. Can I stay awake for another 15 hours? I've already been up 24 hours. Can I really stay up and have my faculties intact to do this credible, incredible operation? Once I got into the operating room, something happened. And, and that's called the zone. And 
and athletes talk about the zone, yet I, I don't know how to explain it. I was, a, I was an athlete younger when I was younger, and I remember setting the high school record in the 100-meter dash, um, and I felt this sense of uh, moving effortlessly through time, effortlessly through space, and everybody else stood still. And I think that's what athletes meant. And doing this operation was really the same way. It was this effortless motion where you're looking down a goggle. You don't know what's going on around you. Um, you. You almost can't hear. All you're seeing is the task ahead of you. And you're, and you're moving very, very quickly, yet everybody else is moving in slow motion. It's really an incredible feeling that I've only felt this one time in my life. And we begin this operation. And this is a difficult operation. Uh, you have to attach the bones. There are two bones. You have to get them the right length. You have to make sure they're absolutely the right length to attach them. Then you do the tendons. You have 23 tendons. You have to find the scarred tendons in the forearm of this individual. Um, well, there's no markings on it. You have to find out where they are, and then you have to attach it to the new hand, but you have to do it in the absolute perfect balance. The reason we can use our hands so well is because the tendons in the palm and the tendons in the back are in absolute harmony. Their tensions are set appropriately. Yet there is no cookbook of how to put these tendon tensions together. This hasn't been really done before. Then come the nerves. Well, the reason everything moves is because the nerves have been appropriately put back together. And nerves are like coaxial cable in your TV, um, except there's no red to red, green to green, yellow to yellow <laughs> comment. And you have to put those back together. Then comes the vessels, arteries, and the veins. A and these are tiny structures. The veins were one millimeter. A in fact, we have to use a microscope, magnify it 30 times, and then you're using my uh, sutures that are just a quarter size of the human hair. You actually can't see them with your eyes. And you have to absolutely perfectly bring them back together uh, in order for that to work. Otherwise, the graft will fail. You'll get a clot, and it'll fail. And to add to the tension of all this is we haven't done this before. There is no cookbook on how to do it. And make it even harder, your hands are frozen. We have to do this on ice to preserve the hand. So my, my hands were, were burning. They were so cold. And all I could think about was I wish somebody could pour warm water on my fingers. 15 hours later, the operation is done. And we take this young Marine into the recovery area. It was this great sense doing this operation that I felt. It was a sense of uh, failure is not an option. I'm not going to be denied. There's no way this is going to fail. And I remember at the same time thinking, I wonder if this is what the jet fighter pilots feel like when they're trying to land this multi-million dollar plane on top of an aircraft carrier in the middle of the night in some, some unknown gulf somewhere. The Marine is back into the operating room. He's finished. He's back into the recovery area. And I asked him to move. I asked him to move his fingers when he woke up. I started with the thumb. There's a flicker of the thumb. He hasn't had a hand for six years. Then the index finger. Then the small finger. By the time we're at the small finger, there's not a dry eye in the room. And I'm continuously sobbing. Uh, it's an incredible feeling to be able to give back to someone that's given so much to you. I went back to California, and then I met him a year later. I, I met him back at the Pentagon. And outside of family events, this was one of the really the most incredible events of my life, is because I looked at his face, and I shook his hand. And the hand was warm. It was strong. And it was sweaty. Human hands are sweaty if they have nerve function. Uh, and of course, I'm going to get a pose. I'm going to get a photo op. So I'm like, well, let's get one arm wrestling. Next thing you know, this young Marine has pinned me, and I can't get out. Uh, not really a great photo op. So uh, my practice has changed in, in, in Los Angeles, in that I've been involved with this incredible organization where we reconstruct our wounded service members' hands. Uh, when they're injured in these two conflicts, they're, we, we pay for their operations. We take care of them. So a good portion of my, my, opera, my practice is taking care of these guys, reconstructing their hands to those that have given so much. Yeah, I'm, I'm not flying, flying fighter jets, but I'm reconstructing those that have been injured doing so. 